The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, judge eternal. You love justice and hate oppression, and you call us to share your zeal for truth. Give us courage to stand with the victims of bloodshed and greed and following your prophets and servants to look to the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. I, I have turned off the little portable microphone again because I was getting feedback already, and I haven't said anything radical, and already I'm getting feedback, you know. But, uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, we're glad that you're with us, and if you're visiting especially, we're delighted to have you among us. And of course, today we are also very delighted to have, for the first time, uh, officially with us, Mr. Timothy Gnome, who's uh, our new director of music. And very exciting times, uh, musically and spiritually, uh, working together with you and the choir and so forth, so glad that you're here. Uh, and after the service, of course, today is potluck, so we have uh, food and, and fun and fellowship and all the usual. Uh, don't disappear, please stay and enjoy all of that as well. In our calendar, Tuesdays, uh, food pantry for those who need food. If you are one of those who help to supply food for the hungry of our community, God bless you. And if you or someone you know needs food, uh, please keep that in mind and, and come Tuesdays downstairs uh, beginning at 11 o'clock. Uh, Wednesdays, our potluck and Bible study continues. We're uh, more than knee deep, we're waist deep in the book of Genesis and uh, getting to the really interesting part. So please keep that in mind. If you've not uh, joined us for study before, uh, we meet at 6.30 for uh, food and around 7.15ish or so we get serious with prayer and, and conversation and study, so keep that in mind. Thursday is a very exciting day for our little congregation. Uh, the uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department came to us about uh, five months ago and suggested that we uh, partner, collaborate uh, with, uh, with them to provide a support group and other services to ex-offenders in the Hollywood area. So we are launching this after uh, many weeks of discussions and planning, we're launching this uh, this coming Thursday at 4.30 in the afternoon. It will also be down in, in Derby Hall. So if, uh, if you or someone you know is an ex-offender and trying to get your life back in order, you need help, you just need people that will stand with you as, uh, as life moves forward in a positive way, keep that in mind. It's not a religious event, it's just a support group. And uh, there will be people from time to time who will come in and be able to speak or plan uh, with ex-offenders on uh, how to get whatever benefits or services or find housing or look for jobs or whatever that might be to, uh, to help folks. So that's a, it's a, we hope, a very vital and important service to be providing. Uh, this, uh, this coming Thursday also, I don't know why I didn't put it in the bulletin, you think, um, but the choir will begin to rehearse and Tim already has music planned for next Sunday, which is hopefully a special Sunday. So. Uh, and you can actually, if you're in the choir or want to be, you can pick the music up today. So uh, keep that in mind. Because next Sunday I'm dubbing Amazing Grace Sunday. We will uh, not only sing the hymn and hear a little of the backstory of, of uh, how that hymn came to be, but also uh, we have a full-length feature film, uh, Amazing Grace, which uh, stars, I guess it's pronounced Johan Griffin. And, uh, and who's the other guy? Uh, Albert Finney. Why, how can I forget? Uh, at any rate, uh, it is the story of the ending of the, of the British slave trade, 19th century, and how that hymn, Amazing Grace, uh, came to be written uh, by John Newton. So I, I hope that you can join us for that. It, uh, it's a two-hour film, so it's not for the faint of heart, you know. Actually, it's perfect because next week will be hot in summer, and what else is there to do on a hot sun, uh, summer Sunday afternoon but stay indoors with the air conditioning and watch a movie? So that's what we'll do. I think that you'll find it very meaningful. Okay, enough of all that. Uh, in our prayers, uh, Gerald Rockwell is at the Veterans Hospital in Westwood. He was to have had uh, heart bypass surgery last week and they have postponed it uh, and it will happen this week. He uh, has nearly 100% blockage of one artery and something like 70% in another artery. So please keep Gerald in your prayers uh, and Georgina and the whole family it should go very well, but it's always kind of frightening. So 
he's uh, certainly on my part. Father Hans is doing well at the uh, convalescent home in Silmar, sends his love and his greetings to everybody, he wishes he was here, and, and I hope that he will be soon. Mary Holman still doing uh, well down... Uh, Westminster. Yeah, Westminster. It's Orange County, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Westminster, down there. Uh, and we had good reports about Carl's nephew, uh, Kevin, who's had better time after some medication changes. We're praying for his recovery. Uh, Sabrina Murphy is Marie Sorensen's grand niece. She's had apparently a very difficult pregnancy and C-section uh, delivery, lost a lot of blood. So please keep Sabrina in your prayers as well. Uh, Richards have asked for prayers for their friend Mary Lou Savage, who is also diagnosed with cancer. And I'm continuing on my prayer list, and hopefully on yours, uh, to raise up the name of uh, Donovan Mejia. He was a little four-year-old who had brain, a brain tumor several weeks ago. Uh, he is home. I've talked to his dad recently. They're doing much better after the surgery, uh, but it's still very frightening. He may have to have chemotherapy to prevent any possibility that the brain tumor would reoccur. So keep Donovan in your prayers as well. And we have a candle lighted in memory of, uh, of Lori Rostad's uh, uncle, uh, Eric Torvala, I have to get the pronunciation correct, who died recently in Finland. It's a long prayer list. There are others in your service folder. Please take this with you and use it to guide your prayers during the week. Thank you. Let's then turn to the uh, reading of the scriptures this morning. Good morning. The first reading is from Jeremiah. 23, 23 through 29. Because Jeremiah preaches the unpopular message of God's judgment, he suffers a rejection. Today's reading distinguishes between the true prophet like Jeremiah, who speaks God's word, and the false prophet who misleads people through dreams. One is like wheat, the other is like worthless straw. I am a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off, who can hide this in secret places that I cannot see them, says the Lord. I do not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long? Will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back, those who prophesy lies and whose prophecy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another. Just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal, let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord, is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces, the word of the Lord. Please follow me in the reading of Psalm 82. Please read the parts in bold. God stands to charge the divine council assembled, giving judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you be judgment justly? Show favor to the wicked. Save the weak and the orphan, defend the humble and needy. They do not know, neither do they understand. They wander about in darkness. All foundations of the earth are shaken. And God I say to you, you are God's, and all of your children are the most high. Nevertheless, you shall li die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations. The second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 29 through 12. Chapter 11. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if they were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? 
for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Zepeth, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commanded for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we were surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Let us run with the perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, for the sake of the joy that was set before him and endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to Luke, the twelfth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I'm under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends, grace and mercy and power and strength from our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In uh, today's second reading, we have a part of a longer passage about faith. The writer quickly tells a whole lot of holy history, and he mentions, uh, he or she mentions well-known heroes whose stories fill the pages of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old old Covenant. Uh, People who lived by faith. And faith, of course, is pretty central to the Christian message, isn't it? We tout the faith of our fathers. We sing the song, my faith looks up to thee. Every week we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. But there's a problem here. Most of us, let's be honest, 
most of us don't have much faith. Jesus says in a parable that if we had just as, as much faith as a tiny mustard seed, that we would be able to, to order a mountain to pick itself up and move if we had that much faith. Jesus chided his own people for their lack of faith, not just, you know, for their suspicion about him, but for their lack of faith in the promises of God above. He made examples of outsiders, such as the, the centurion or the good Samaritan who really lived by faith in God. But faith is hard. Just as with qualities of truth and courage, we don't think of faith or use faith unless we're stuck or, or, or we're trapped. In public affairs, we usually don't vote out of our sense of faith. We vote from our fears or our cynicism. We don't use faith easily when it comes, when it comes to our, our human relationships, do we? I mean, we go to therapists first, or if necessary, we go to divorce court. But faith, we're not so sure whether that will alter our, our inner life. We don't give out of our faith either. We're afraid that we won't have enough left over for ourselves. And so we don't trust uh, our own generosity. I've served a number of churches, and this is the first one where I really thought that the leadership, the church council, actually starts with faith in Christ, rather than with skepticism or, or suspicion when they have a, a tough decision to face. Faith is hard. We know that. And in recent months, the larger church beyond our doors also has made some pretty big decisions based on faith and not on fear. Last May, our synod here in the Los Angeles area elected a new bishop who is Native American, the first time that Lutherans have ever done that. And he's also gay, and that's definitely a first. There are reasons, obviously, to fear the consequences of doing something new and radical. But what usually holds people back is their lack of faith. And then this past week, the delegates or voting members uh, at our uh, National Churchwide Assembly meeting in Pittsburgh have done something very courageous in faith. We've had uh, an outstanding man as the head of our national church for 12 years, uh, the Reverend Mark Hansen, but voters did not vote to re-elect him. They chose for a new presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, a woman, the Reverend Elizabeth Eaton, who, uh, who currently is the bishop of the Northeast Ohio Synod, so she's now moving up to head the entire denomination. It's a huge step for the ELCA. Although our Reformation Church has been going for nearly 500 years, it's only in the 1970s did a whole group of stodgy old white men say, well, okay, we think that maybe women do have gifts for ministry and they could be ordained as pastors of the church. And then it was another 10 years before there was a woman who was elected as a, as a synod uh, or regional bishop. And now a full 40 years before this exciting day has come. On Thursday, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church issued this brief statement. Let me read just a bit of it to you. I give thanks for the faithful ministry of Mark Hansen as presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America over the last 12 years. It's been an honor and privilege to share ministry with him during the last seven years. I have learned much from his prophetic and gifted evangelical ministry. I pray that the next chapter of his ministry may be a rich blessing to him, his family, and many others. I also give thanks for the election of Elizabeth Eaton as the next presiding bishop of the ELCA and look forward to working with her as we grow in our call to common mission. I anticipate a journey of mutual discovery of the gifts God so richly bestows on our two churches, particularly in new contexts and populations. May God bless the journey and may God bless the pastoral leadership of Bishop Eaton. Signed, the Most Reverend Catherine Jeffords Scorey, presiding, presiding bishop and primate. Yes, the Episcopal Church also has a woman as their presiding bishop. Our churches have now finally thrown off all of that uncertainty, that nagging doubt about whether we're supposed to obey every last word of the scripture, literally in matters of, of faith and life, or whether we can trust the Holy Spirit in faith. While St. Paul says somewhere that women were to be silent in church, and if they had any questions, they could ask their husbands at home, 
it's taken 2,000 years for all of us to understand that Paul himself was conditioned by his culture not to think outside the box. But the Holy Spirit of God works outside of the box. Amen? Amen. Christians have passed off our reluctance to, to trust God as, well, we're keeping tradition rather than to admit that we're lacking faith. We've ignored this testimony about Jesus where it clearly says that Martha was stuck in the kitchen and she was resentful, but Mary sat at Jesus' feet eagerly. Some Christians are ready to move on and, and to be courageous and to speak out of our, our inner faith and, and our profound life experiences, which have shaped us and empowered us to trust God more and more, not less and less. I mentioned the second reading. Most scholars think that the book of Hebrews wasn't written by St. Paul. His name was never on the original manuscript. And scholars who've spent years analyzing the complex issues here of, of literary form, of vocabulary, textual criticism, they all say that Hebrews wasn't a, a letter that was sent by a messenger to some of the churches that, that Paul had served. It was written as a tightly constructed essay or sermon, a study to explain the priesthood of Jesus Christ before God. And they say that it was likely written by a woman not by a man. If that's true, it's the only book in our Holy Bible that was written by a woman. It's one of the most polished writings in the New Testament. It has a richer vocabulary, and, and, and scholars are saying that uh, if, if it wasn't written by St. Paul, which looks very dubious that it could have been, perhaps one of his students or his associates wrote the work. And the, the list of his uh, possible associates is pretty short. I mean, you even probably know most of the names I would mention. Uh, we know that Luke traveled with Paul and that Barnabas and Apollos were missionaries also that worked with him. Timothy was his protege, a, a young man whose father was Greek and his mother was Jewish. Well, those names come up from time to time in sermons or studies and we don't give them a lot of thought because their name is not on this book. There are two other persons uh, that might be responsible for it. And there are people mentioned in the New Testament. They're definitely associates and travelers with St. Paul. In fact, they had the same day job as he had, their way of making a living as they traveled and, and preached and taught. Paul was a tent maker, which, okay, somebody has to make tents, I guess. Uh, they didn't come from China 2,000 years ago. But Paul made tents, and that's a pretty portable career by definition. He could go anywhere and make and sell his tents. And so did these two, Priscilla and Aquila, a married Jewish couple that were living in Rome when he met them and he brought them to Christ. And very early on, they began to travel with Paul. And Paul says that they risked their necks to save his life. But interestingly, Priscilla is mentioned first. Not her husband's name, but her name comes first when he mentions them. It's, that's extraordinary for ancient times when, when women were constrained by social uh, customs to stay out of sight. Priscilla was a very confident woman who was a very close associate to Paul. It can't be proven that Priscilla wrote this powerful study or this, this sermon on, uh, to the Hebrews. That's the only title we have for it. But for more than 100 years now, serious scholars have suggested it, and for a reason I never really thought of before, if this work had been written by a St. Luke or a St. Barnabas or St. Timothy, men who already had a good reputation, their names would have been stuck on it very prominently because people would say, oh, this is important. We know who these, these men are. So scholars now think that, that either the name of the author has been removed because the author was merely a woman, or to make sure that the work itself would be honored and accepted as important Christian teaching, that it wouldn't have been if a woman's name was on it. So women weren't as respected then. So it may have been to protect the work, someone just politely said, we don't know who wrote it. And the work is with us today in our Bibles. What I'm seeing here and why I bring all this up is that it's very clear from the beginning of Jesus' ministry that people had a hard time living by faith if it seemed a little too radical, stepping out in faith in order to, to follow the Spirit of God. It's always easier to stick to the, the habits and, and the patterns that we've, we've lived with, right? And, and the culture and the, 
conditions of our community and our society. It takes a fierce courage not to conform, not to blend in. It takes courage to face enemies, whether they're enemies abroad or enemies inside of us. It takes faith to trust that, that God will help us overcome our fears and, and our shortcomings, our failures, that God will give us the nerve and the power to stare down demons and to fight off cowardice or complacency. There's actually uh, an Olympic reference in this text, too. We've been, of course, hearing the talk about the Olympic Games because of the news in Russia recently, and it certainly comes to mind. The Olympic Games began in ancient times. The word marathon actually comes from the Greek town of Marathon. Everybody in Greek culture back then knew the lore of the games and athletic competition and all that. And much like the, the modern games, which imitated the, the ancient uh, Olympic Games, a marathon race would, you know, it covered 26 and a half miles or something close to that. Uh, but it would come to an end, it would conclude in the stadium when the victor would run this victory lap around the track in the sight of thousands of onlookers and, and cheerleaders cheering them on for winning the race. So the writer of Hebrews here in this passage sees Jesus as running a victory lap after his bloody and painful struggle. Rather than seeing Jesus as a loser in the world's view because he was crucified, he was executed, he is a winner in the full view of God and all the saints, all those heroes of faith that, that she mentions earlier, countless others that she doesn't name. This huge cloud of witnesses. It's an amazing picture language, isn't it? Today we use cloud, of course, uh, quite a bit differently, and I'm not talking weather here. Our data is stored in the cloud. Even our software is in the cloud. If you have an iPhone, you're living in the cloud, so to speak. I've been using Dropbox now for over a year, and I love it. But in Hebrews 12, the first verse, there's this entirely different meaning of the cloud. Not a cloud full of computer geeks, but a cloud of witnesses. I know it seems like this kind of three-story universe, you know, with heaven above and hell down below and, and we're in the middle. But here the cloud represents the totality, the everybody of the saints and witnesses, the martyrs who endured to the end and now have a place in God's sight before God's throne. Our culture has a lot of jokes about this kind of thing, the pearly gates and the dead popping up through the clouds, you know, to appear before St. Peter, wondering if they're going to be let into to heaven or not. But the Bible actually says that all who lived and died in Christ, and not only them, but all who lived and died with faith and certainty in God's promises, all those are in the cloud of witnesses. Maybe a three-story universe seems kind of contrived or corny or, or unreal for us. I mean, how do we know, after all, if there really is a heaven up there somewhere? But as we study this, this passage, it, it comes clear, this idea of victory and the throne of God. It was picture language. It was a way to, to try what people would understand from the, from the athletic competitions, from the sports, the picture language that she used in the, the sports letter to the Hebrews, as if heaven itself is like this gigantic Olympic stadium in which the powerful and the fearful struggles of faith have, have played out and the victory is now won and the victor is, is seated, has run the lap and is, is seated at the throne of God, with God. Where's, where's our place in this picture? For those of us probably almost all of us who would never buy a gym membership after all. I mean, this kind of seems misplaced. But the picture language is really very good. It, it puts you and me into the race ourselves, into the marathon. It's a race for our lives. The race is overcoming all of the things that hold us back in life or, or set us up for failure. It's the race to become all that we can be to use the gifts of God that we have and that we can become the very people that God imagines we can be. We've entered this race, maybe, maybe out of admiration of Jesus, who is sprinting on ahead of us. Deep inside, there is this, this longing to taste his victory and to hear the cheering of other witnesses. 
So we gave up being bystanders and we got on our feet and we got, got out there and plunged into the streets to follow Jesus and he's way ahead of us. With help, the writer says, with help, you will not lose heart. You will not grow faint. Don't give up if you have faith. That's the key, my friends. It's trust. It's fearlessness in trusting the promises of God, not just that there is a, a, a heaven up there in the sky, but that there's victory here and power right here in our hearts and, and, and strength in our souls if we'll just invest faith in the one who gave his life for us and who now is at God's right hand. Amen? Amen.
our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the tower. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into the heaven and is seated at the right hand. Rejoice with all God's creation around God's throne. The light of the risen Christ puts to flight all evil deeds, washes away sin, restores innocence to the fallen, casts out hate, and humbles earthly pride. Jesus Christ loves you and frees you from all your sins by his blood. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In Christ Jesus we are reconciled with each other and we have peace with God. May peace be with you all. And also with you. Share the peace.
rise for prayer. Confident in God's compassionate rule and enduring love, let us lift up the needs of the church, the world, and all creation. Almighty Father, send the fire of your word to cleanse and refine your church and shine the light of the gospel to all ends of the earth. Especially, we pray for our bishops elect Elizabeth and Guy, that your Holy Spirit in them may empower your church anew. God, in your mercy. Amen. Compassionate God, bring your cooling and refreshing breath into the world's parched places. Protect the very young and the old, the earth's fragile habitats, endangered species, and all that is vulnerable to the heat. God, in your mercy. Righteous God, all the nations belong to you. Grant peace and justice to the earth. Calm the fever of passions and weapons. End the bloodshed, especially in Egypt and Syria. And bring solace and protection to the homeless and the orphan. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, give safety to those in harm's way and grant wholeness and healing to all who are suffering. Especially, we pray, for Gerald, anxiously awaiting surgery for his heart, Sabrina, suffering in pregnancy and childbirth, Mary, Joyce, Ellie, and Mercy, for strength and capacity, Corinne and Kevin, for wholeness and strength, Daniel and Carolyn, awaiting treatment and surgery, Father Hans, for healing and peace of mind, Raul Sr. and Bert, Diane, Patty, Carol, Mary Lou, Dolores, Rena, Ray, and William, who are fighting cancer. Donovan, recovering from brain surgery. And for Diana, Bobby, Mario, Edward, Bob and Brenda, Ruth Ann, Patty and Scott, for health and wholeness. God, in your mercy. Faithful God, guide our congregation through times of uncertainty and change. Grant courage and faith sufficient to meet the challenges of living out the gospel in our place and time. God, in your mercy. And now, as members of Christ's family, it is our opportunity to offer forth our prayers, our petitions, our thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. Bye. 
eternal God, fulfill your promise to those who have run with perseverance the race, especially your servant Eric. And at the last, join us with that great cloud of witnesses before your everlasting throne. God, in your mercy. God of mercy, hear the cries of your people and answer us with your grace and steadfast love. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our offerings and tithes will be received. with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to God Almighty. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is our joy and our duty to give you thanks, O God, always and everywhere, that we gather in the name of Jesus Christ. By the witness of your saints, you reveal to us the hope of our calling and the strength we have to run the race set before us. So with believers everywhere and with saints and angels above, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs>
righteous, O God, and worthy to be praised by every generation of your faithful people. We thank you for your grace and love, and especially for the gifts and promises of our Lord Jesus, who in his ministry of compassion, in his living and dying, fulfilled your purpose to redeem the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave you thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples with these words, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he took a cup and gave you thanks and gave it for all to drink with these words. This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. We remember, therefore, the gift of his life, his suffering and death, his rising and sending your Holy Spirit. We await his coming again. Breathe into us the spirit of his life. Nourish us with this holy bread and cup, that in accord with Christ's promises, they are for us the bread of life and the cup of salvation. With these gifts, fill us with heavenly grace and faith, that we become Christ's presence in the world, blessed, broken, and given away to those who hunger and thirst for your grace. For through him, with him, in him, with the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. In the spirit of simplicity and faith, we raise up the prayer our Savior has given to us. Our Father, Father in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus gave himself as the bread of heaven for the life of the world. We break this bread in many pieces that many may share in his life. Come to the table of mercy.
God, our Creator and Redeemer, send us, your children, with the power of your Holy Spirit to proclaim your grace and to announce that the peace of your reign is near to us, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. May our Lord's body and his precious blood, which you have received, strengthen you with all faith and grant you grace for life. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.